This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 342. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Good morning to you. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the huge show today? Let's rock. All right. Well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, in the second half of the show, Lennart Pottering from Red Hat will join us. He's the creator of Systemd, Pulse Audio, and a few other things. We're going to talk about all things Systemd, future ways to possibly have a unified software distribution system for the Linux desktop. And he corrected a few misconceptions I had about the original creation of Systemd. Uh, new information, to me at least, that sort of fundamentally changes the way I think about the project. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good chat. It's very extensive. Also, coming up in the news segment, Matthew Miller from the Fedora Project joins us to talk about the upcoming Fedora 21 release. And if that wasn't enough, Ooh. Random Phillips from CoreOS joins us to talk wow. about their new initiative, Rocket, which promises to bring some serious competition to Docker. It is a huge show. Huge. Plus, we've got our regular news, picks, and feedback. A lot of stuff. Show. So let's start with our picks this week. Uh, this was submitted to the subreddit, uh, our Runs Linux. I had a totally different Runs Linux queued up, uh, but then after some consultation with uh, with a wise consultant who said, Chris, you've got to go with anything that's Nick Cage. And I This is true. Gotta I, I got to agree with that. The new Nicolas Cage movie runs Linux. Uh, so this came in from uh, Pityri, I think is how you say yeah, his name. Yeah, sounds right. Sure. He says, the new Nicolas Cage movie, Dying of the Light, shows a scene where a Romanian doctor is getting interrogated in his office. And as you can see from the screenshots below, he's clearly using Ubuntu with the ambience theme. So uh, get uh, get your spot and eye out, Matt. Let's see, there's Nick Cage. Yep, there he is. Uh, sitting there looking like Nick Cage. Yeah, he's kind of, he's got, and he's mid- Mid, you know, yeah. speaking Mid, thing. Yeah, and what I like what Nick. what uh, what Penny did here was he got some of like the most iconic Nick Cage faces. Oh, he totally so, did. Yeah, he nailed like, it. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and look, right very there, raising Arizona. You see the uh, you can see the uh, oh, yeah. the close buttons there. Clearly, 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 that's a button. He's leaning and he's going, "Hey, hey, yeah. why no arch? Yeah, what's going on?" Yeah, for, yeah. <laughs> and there's another one. There's another great shot nice. of uh, the oh, ambience the theme. And uh, there's a great angry Nick Cage yes. face uh, with another good shot. <laughs> And then, uh, last but not least, the remorseful thinking Nick Cage with mm. the Ubuntu screenshot. So what we have here is four, five, actually five shots of, and we also have documented all of the faces that Nick Cage makes while acting. This is why you even hire Nick Cage. You get these five faces. And Pity <laughs> documented Ubuntu in all five shots. That's awesome. I mean, you got your Nick Cage and your Ubuntu. In yeah. What more do you want in life? Yeah. I mean, really. yeah. But is that really Nick Cage, or is he just wearing that face? Is it a mask? Could be somebody else. Could be. His face could be off. Anyways, the new Nicolas Cage movie runs Linux. It's That's pretty, cool. That's pretty outrageous. That is great. awesome. Uh, we have a huge show to get to, so uh, let's start and take care of some business and talk to our great friends over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean.com. Go there right now, everybody. we got a brand new promo code. It's last December. When you check out last December, we'll get you a $10 credit over DigitalOcean. Now, why would you want a $10 credit? Well, because you're not an animal? Probably. Duh. Because DigitalOcean rocks. It's simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server that you get root access to. And you can get started in less than 55 seconds. Pricing plans start at only $5 per month. Ooh. They get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD. They're all SSD, one mm -hmm. CPU, and a terabyte of dedicated transfer. And DigitalOcean, you're like, oh, that's great. That's cool. Well, guess what? DigitalOcean has got rocking data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. And you're like, Chris, you say they're rocking. Why are they rocking? Son, go check them out on Google+. Plus. They got pictures uh -huh. up there of that data center, and I'm just saying they're beautiful. Go over to DigitalOcean. Check out their awesome dashboard. It's simple and intuitive, and power users can replicate the functionality of that dashboard with DigitalOcean's straightforward API that rocks so hard, there's already fantastic apps available to the community. But you might have noticed, even just doing some casual Googling, that DigitalOcean has some of the best tutorials on the web. And there's a reason for it. They recognized that having an awesome infrastructure, powered by Linux, utilizing KVM, sitting top of SSDs with tier one data centers all over the world, that's, that's a pretty good recipe. You combine it with the world's best interface for spinning up servers, doing snapshots, one-click deployment of applications, utilizing technologies like Docker, deploying distributions like CoreOS with direct support from the CoreOS team. You know, that's, that's a pretty good combo. Uh -huh. That's pretty good. 
but they need to make sure they also have the other end, the community tutorials. They have to have that dialed in. So DigitalOcean is willing to pay up to $200 per tutorial. they got a range they're willing to pay you depending on the quality, and they even have dedicated editors to work with you to make sure they're totally rocking tutorials because they know that's an important component to the DigitalOcean service. So head over to DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code LAST December, all one word, lowercase, when you check out. Why not do the one-click install of something like Ghost or GitLab or Rails? It's pretty cool. My wife Angela did a, you can now do a WordPress deployment where you just go WordPress plus Ubuntu mm -hmm. in one. Uh, that's you what I do it. all day it's long. A, it's a straight-up, legit, vanilla Ubuntu installation. You were pointing out, too, for the security conscious, they've got two-factor authentication. That's right. Uh, HT, uh, HT password, I believe, in, you know, as far as in your directories. I love that. And I love, out of the box. I love the HTML5 console in yes. the web browser, too. You can see it from boot to post, or from post all mm -hmm. the way up to full boot. It's really great. DigitalOcean.com. Go over there right now. Get our $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig. Two months for absolutely free. Last December. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Love okay, it. Matt, uh, we're going to do a make good for Chris this week. Uh -huh. One of my number one go-to tools that I have used for years. Uh -huh. And it, it, as, as somebody who cares a lot about video quality, uh, I cannot believe I've never made this pick. I searched it. I didn't see it. If I had made this pick right. in the past, it's totes worth making again. It's called MKV Toolnix. Hmm. And it's that's one word, MKV Tool N-I-X. And this is, a, if you say you're backing up some Blu-rays off the internet, something like that. And when you back it up, maybe it comes in the French language as the first track and English as the second track, or vice versa. Right. Maybe you want it in French, but the primary track is English. And maybe you're playing it on a device that isn't intelligent enough to let you switch between the audio mm -hmm. tracks. You'd really just mm -hmm. like to have mm -hmm. the one audio track. That's right. Maybe you even want to save size and just drop the French audio track altogether because you don't need it, right? That's right. Traditionally, the easiest way to do this would be to re-encode the video. In fact, that's what the majority of tools that solve this do, is they re-encode the video, they strip out the audio. That's no good. No. You get less no. quality every time you re-encode it. If you move it from the original to something else, you're going to have a degradation there. So MKV Tool Nix is my go-to resource for stripping out things from an AK MKV file without having to transcode the video or the audio again. Oh, no kidding. You can edit an existing MKV file. So here we go. I've got, let's just say for purposes of demonstration, Absolutely. Home Alone 2. I downloaded it, but unfortunately, uh, it's in French. Oh! Now, I checked in VLC, and I saw there was an English track there. Now, in VLC, I could easily switch to English track, sure, problem solved. Sure. But on my Roku, can't really switch so Not easily. Not so much, no. So all I have to do is I bring the file into MKV Merge, uh, which is part of the MKV Toolix uh, set, and you can go in here and just pull out the track. So here I see, I see French, and here is uh, English, right? So uh, I can go in here, I can just take out the French uh, English track, and also I'm going to take out both subtitle tracks, because I don't need those. Now I just tell it where I want it to save the file at, and it will reconstitute a new MKV file without doing any transcoding, so it's as fast as your disk I.O. will allow for reading it and writing it to oh, somewhere that's else. that's fantastic. doesn't take up a ton of CPU because you're not running it through a transcoder. It's a really, really handy tool. So find MKV Merge. It's part of the MKV Toolnix toolset, which I'll have linked in the show notes. It's probably in your distro repo already. That it's extremely it. handy. Uh, and MKV Merge also combined with MKV or Media Info. I'm sorry, Media Info, which is one we've talked about mm -hmm. before on the show. But Media Info is that program that'll let you look at these files and see what's going on here. What's why is this in French? So you don't even have to open it up in VLC oh, necessarily. Nice. Uh, so uh, you could just you can just take a file from in here and drag it in here. Now, unfortunately, like like say like let's take this WebM file. It works for all types of files, right? I drop it in here. I can see the bit rate, the resolution, the frame rate, the codec. I can see the audio codec. I've had multiple channels. I'd see them all in here. So you combine these tools together, and you can extract the bits from these MKV files that you don't want without losing any quality at all. Well, and a lot of people have, like, let's say you got DVDs at home, and it's like, okay, they may be in English, but they may have subtitles and other mm -hmm. stuff you mm -hmm. don't want. Mm -mm. You pull those out. Boom. Definitely. No encoding extra. All right. So I've talked in the past about smoke bing, but it's mm -hmm. it's pretty epic to set up. And sometimes you just need to know for a little while if your ISP is screwing you right. or if a connection to a server is shaky. Ping does the job, but it's not very visual. You just get mm -hmm. ping back this time, ping right, back yeah. this time. Well, there's a great shell script out there 
that I think was mentioned maybe in our server. I came across it somewhere. It's called yeah. prettyping.sh. Some distros have it available as a package. It's in the AUR, for example. Prettyping.sh is really, it's a wrapping of a lot of your standard tools that you probably already have installed. Uh, and I have a link directly in the show notes. If you want to just grab the script yourself, you can look oh. at it. You basically need to have ping, awk, and a couple other things. Uh, not a big deal. You have it already. So let me show it to you. I have it running here for a little bit. And uh, I've been pinging Google since we started the show. And so, it, so it's pretty ping.sh. Oh, yeah, that is helpful because then you can spot patterns. Exactly. So you see these little notches are yeah. increase in latency. And this along the top is my sort of key for what the different uh, mm. bars mean. So you can see I'm getting about in, between 20, 10 and 20 milliseconds on the high end. My, so right there it tells you the last. It gives you your average, how many right. you've lost. And I could run this during a game. And if I notice I'm having some, I was trying this recently, I noticed I was having some problems in the online performance. Right. I looked at this, saw my latency was way up, and it's like, oh, crap, stupid Chris, you left your Wi-Fi connection on, disabled my Wi-Fi, went ah. to Ethernet, much better time. This pretty ping is just a quick way you can ping anything to just get an idea of how your overall performance is. And it's interesting, looking at it here on Comcast, mm -hmm. Versus my FiOS connection at yeah, home. Yeah, what's that comparison look like? FiOS connection for the last couple of days has been much smoother. Only maybe one or two notches where you okay. can see here. I'm, look, there's a big one right there. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No, that that pops up pretty high. So pretty ping. Yeah. It's a shell script you can just go grab and run it yourself. It might already be in your distro repo too. It is in the AUR. Uh, it's got a name. Of, it's got something else affixed to the end of it, but I got a link in the show notes. And it's just a. It's a great. Yeah. I, it's a. It's not. I guess it's an open source project. It's, it's up a on script. I mean, yeah. it's like I mean, yeah. it's <laughs> exactly. like it's running open source stuff. Yeah, it's up on know? Bitbucket. I mean, it's just yeah. bringing tools together you already know and love. Yeah. But uh, it makes it pretty. It for you. Yeah, exactly. So pretty pang, and I also have a yeah. video in the show notes if you guys want to. That's cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna test that out. I I really want to test out because I have this theory. I have a VPN I use, and I then I have my uh, standard files, and yeah. I there is a difference. I a know huge difference. I know, I know, and I would be curious to see what if we you know you could you could turn on the VPN, turn off the VPN, and see what that changes. Because I mean. Just like in usage, oh man, no question. I mean, I'm not saying the files connection is bad, but I definitely notice it's more stable. Yeah, that's. I don't know. The situation of uh, the ISP situation in the United States is a train wreck, mm -hmm. and only getting better. Ha ha ha! ha, ha. <laughs> Speaking of good and getting better, uh, we want to take uh, a uh, best of special. We want to take the week of around Christmas, and uh, for the first time ever, give the hosts of the Jupiter Broadcasting shows the week off. Woo. In fact, if you've noticed, just about every show since it's launched really never misses a week. And so that is that is really something, to show up every single week and do a show. And we thought the best way to say thank you for a great year to all of the hosts would say, take the week off. The only way we can really do that, though, is if we can come together with the best of. Now, we have a bunch of good submissions for the Linux Action Show, but in the show notes, I've got a link. We're looking for best of moments for all of... Well, not all of the shows, but a lot of the shows. Okay. Linux Action Show, Linux Unplugged, TechSnap, and Coda Radio. Okay. And we've got a really easy-to-use Google form. You just put the episode title in there, a link to the episode, the time code, what it was you thought was great, any additional info you want, and you submit it, and it goes to a spreadsheet. We have that spreadsheet made uh, public right now, so you can... Oop, hi there. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Cabbage. So there you go. So you can see we've got some entries, but there's a oh. lot of last entries. A lot of last entries. Yeah. We need some entries for the other shows, because we've been mostly promoting it in Linux Unplugged and the Linux Action Show subreddit, and now we're getting close to where we need to edit, and we don't have very many submissions for Linux Unplugged, Coda Radio, or TechSnap. We could really use your help. I'll have a link in the show notes. It's also sticky to the top Linux Action Show subreddit. We're looking for best of submissions for those shows, and that would really, really, really be helpful, because then we can put something together and give the host the week off, which would be cool. awesome. That'd be cool. All right, Matt, let's do the news. <laughs> Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Matt, Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider, and Matt's mobile right. service provider. You know, I really like that Note 2 case. Tell You've me. got, like, the best case. Well, and it's very FBI. Do you, you can just, yeah, like, drop yeah, that yeah. and, like, impress Do you kind of feel like a big phone hipster? Because you were rocking the large screens way before, right. like, Johnny Ives thought it was a great idea. I, I like it because I don't feel like... I, I don't feel like my thumbs have the dumb. Right. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah. like I can actually yeah. get things yeah. done. So, That's why yeah. I like Ting, because I, Ting, I feel like my phone doesn't have the dumbs. It's no contract, no early termination fee, and you only pay for what you use. You, you just It's six lines, $6 right. for the line, and then it's just your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them all up. Boom. Whatever you fall into, that's what you pay. And it's really simple. That's why I have three lines. And what's awesome is Ting has an early termination relief program. So if you're in a contract right now, they're doing a special do deal where they're going to pay up to 50% of your early termination Ooh. fee. $150 in Ting credits. Plus, when you go to last.ting.com, they'll give you a $25 credit, which if you think about it, 
The average Ting bill right now is about $26 for a Jupiter Broadcasting member. That's a lot of credit. It's going to get you a lot of service. So go over to last.ting.com. Check them out. Take a look at the dashboard, the no-hold customer service, one eight five five ting ftw and a real person answers the phone. But now you can go get a phone you love without any contract. You can just pay for what you use. Hotspot and tethering are included in all of that. It's really cool. And also, if you're curious... On the Ting blog, they put up their post and stance on net neutrality. So I think if, you know, and I think this is probably something Important. when you're thinking about spending your money and you're voting with your wallet, you want to know where a company stands, and they have their blog post up on that. That's right. So last.ting.com is where you go where you go to get started to get our de- discount, which will multiply on top of other discounts that Ting has going on right now. I've been using them for over two years, and I'm glad I switched because I think I've saved almost $2,000 in total. But Matt, now we've got to celebrate. Kyra's here with an app pick. And I feel like this is another one I'm going to have to get because sometimes I'll admit <laughs> I'm using my smartphone a little late at night. Guys, a bit of a break. I'm Kyra, and this thing's app of the week. Yes, I do. Woo. Twilight makes your smartphone easy on the eyes. Research suggests that the blue light emitted by smartphone screens suppresses melatonin production, making it difficult to fall asleep at night. After sunset, Twilight filters out this blue light and adds a warm red tint, All right. which gradually increases as the day wears on. First, set up the app with your preferred color temperature, See? intensity, and desired speed. I do this on my desktop. Yeah, now. I was going to say, that looks Set filter familiar. times based on when you want the app to run, whether always, sun, alarm, or custom. You can set it to auto pause in specific apps like Netflix or YouTube. You can also create multiple profiles in case you want to set different color levels or if multiple people share the same device. Just tap the play button in the top right to activate Twilight. That looks then nice. Oh, yeah. Each that would day, work it'll well. automatically change in the background, slowly warming your screen as the night progresses. Yeah, I'm doing that. Twilight is available on Google Play. There's a link right below me, as well as in the description. While the free version likely has everything you'll need, Pro is available for $250 and includes a few more advanced settings. All right. Thanks for watching, and make sure to subscribe to Ting for more weekly app reviews. I love it. They're always watching the great latest and greatest stuff. So go to last.ting.com to get started. That supports your favorite Linux podcast, but also gets you a great deal on Ting service, last.ting.com. And a big thanks to Ting for their longtime support of the Linux Action Show. Matt, yes. let's shift gears. I'm really excited to welcome Brandon Phillips back on the show, CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. And CoreOS made some big news this week when they announced a new ish- initiative called Rocket. Brandon, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, guys. Hey, so uh, congratulations on uh, the big week. And, uh, Brandon, could we start, uh, could we maybe just really quickly recap for the audience what is Rocket, for those who maybe are not familiar since it's so so new? Sure. So uh, Rocket is a, um, there's a couple of things. The first is it's a, uh, it's a runtime for containers. So um, it, it provides primitives and it, it allows you to download containers and then run them on, on a Linux server. And so uh, for those who aren't familiar with containers, containers are a way of running a process on a, a Linux host um, that uh, is isolated from the rest of the machine, right. uh, meaning that it, it, it provides some, some level of um, protection from the, the rest of the processes. Now, uh, I, I, to be honest, when I think of CoreOS, uh, I, think of, I think of a distribution that was created to be almost all in with Docker. And so when I think of containerization and the, one of the hottest things in technology right now, I think of Docker. So when CoreOS announced something to me that sounds somewhat competitive to Docker, I was sort of surprised. I started reading into it. It sounds like at the start, Docker is still going to be a first-class citizen on CoreOS. So this isn't so much yeah, CoreOS moving away from Docker, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when we started uh, CoreOS, um, you know, you go on the Wayback Machine on uh, wayback.org. Uh, <laughs> they'll... Um, the CoreOS started as uh, a minimal operating system for running containers. And um, uh, and so really it's a design requirement of, of what CoreOS is. We want to have this operating system that's able to update itself. And the only way we're able, able to do that is by isolating the, the applications from the operating system. And so um, uh, Docker was uh, this you know composable building block at the time, and we were really excited about this idea. And that's why we we started to um, jump on, um, and we we helped out, and we we uh, we shipped with Docker. Um, and so uh, over time, the the Docker um, uh, sort of what Docker is building is more of a platform, which is mm. perfectly all right, and mm-hmm. we're fine with that. Um, but we need this uh, small composable unit still in CoreOS, and so. Um, along the way, we wanted to kind of uh, build a couple of other things that we had been thinking about in the container space um, okay. at the same time. 
So uh, along comes Rocket uh, to sort of address this original core need. Uh, when you say composable, what exactly does composable mean? Um, so uh, in the case of Rocket, what it means is that um, when, when Rocket executes, it's executing right underneath whatever process started it. So imagine like you, you've started an init system or something. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, say Apache 2 is a, a direct child of the init system. Um, and this is a really important component because if you're um, expecting that when, it, when you do a, a launching of a process, uh, you expect to have that child there. So you can monitor the health of the child process. You can put that child process inside of a C group before executing it, et cetera. Right, right. And so um, Rocket is essentially, it acts and behaves just like a single binary um, that you would execute under a classic init system. And okay. that's the difference. Okay. And uh, in your post, which uh, I'll have linked in the show notes, you go into a lot, or the, the post goes into a lot of detail, uh, why Rocket. It also goes into uh, some shortcomings of Docker. And I wonder if maybe uh, this has sort of been reacted to stronger than you expected in the press, or did you expect people to be like, oh, it's a container war now? Uh, yeah, I mean, the reaction from the press was a little bit more... Uh, <laughs> uh, inflammatory than I, I think we expected. But yeah. um, I think on, on the upside of, out of all that, I think we've definitely kicked off a conversation mm -hmm. about um, some of the things that people uh, would like to see in this space and some of the, um, the technology choices that people would see. Um, I, I, don't, I think that a lot of the hard technical people totally get what we're building and why we're building it. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, despite all the noise and whatever, uh, I, I think that we, we have a strong chance of, of of making a little bit of um, some good technical decisions here. So there's a couple of things that jumped out at me um, in, in this uh, post, and one of them was, uh, it sounds like a system to facilitate your own, essentially, hub or repository that you could check in and check out of. I, and today, or uh, two days ago, Docker announced sort of this enterprise-level install your own hub kind of system. It's almost a commercial version of what, what sounds like one of the things you want to accomplish with Rocket. Do you have any thoughts on what they had just announced as far as making an enterprise local hub where enterprises could have behind the hub repositories? Is this something that Rocket wants to address from the original design? Um, so one thing that I, I wanted to sort of uh, start a conversation about, and it, it's in the um, in the specification. Oh, so I, I should mention that um, we, we essentially launched two things on Monday. One was we launched Rocket, which is a refer reference implementation of a, of a spec called the applica application container. Mm -hmm. And the application container is something, um, it's, it's a, a technical document explaining kind of how these application containers should work, um, these app containers. And we got feedback from a lot of other folks, not, not just uh, people at CarOS. Um, and so uh, we, we kind of like to see multiple implementations of the app container. Um, going back to the the actual uh, registry in that piece, mm -hmm. um, what what we wanted to do with Rocket and the app container spec is uh, we wanted to just spread the namespace of um, of containers out over the wider internet. So um, that there's really no commercial product focus on what we've uh, what we've described in the app container spec. What we're trying to say is that currently um, the namespace for uh, say on the Docker Hub um, is it's rooted at index.docker.io, and we wanted to define a um, define a protocol where people could host their containers at example.com, so they could host them. Say, so let's imagine the Apache project wanted to host their own container, and they wanted to own that container. They could host the Apache um, the Apache container binary at apache.org. Right, which um, is and we wanted to. Sort of the idea being instead of a centralized point, people could have their own. They could be distributed out. Right. right. You can make the analogy something more like um, Google Apps for domains. Like people, uh, they own their domain, but they're still using Gmail. But mm -hmm. they can swap out and use face, Fastmail or something okay. else at any time. Okay. And, now, and we also wanted to use really simple protocols. So it's um, you can use straight HTTPS as a transport you know, out there. Or uh, BitTorrent, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, BitTorrent too, right? Yeah, so we've been, um, uh, Alex, my co-founder, has been prototyping uh, some BitTorrent stuff, too. And I, I think there's, there's um, 
Yeah, somebody needs to write a really solid BitTorrent library in Go. So okay. if anybody's uh, well, <laughs> listening, I, I really, uh, I really kind of had one more main question about Rocky because it's so new. I feel like I'm, I just kind of want to sit back and watch. But one of the things I think is going to be what would be pretty key. I mean, it's great to have full fledged support in CoreOS. That's definitely going to scratch a, a, an itch. But what kind of steps are you taking with Rocket to help or maybe at least encourage adoption in other enterprise grade distributions? Maybe even oh. Red Hat Enterprise and things like that. Yeah, so uh, we already have issues. There's folks from the Fedora project um, who are uh, helping out. They want to package up um, Rocket for Fedora, um, and that's an issue that's already open. Um, and we we built Rocket as a single standalone binary, so it can run on Ubuntu. We tested that out before we launched. Um, it, it runs fine on Fedora. It runs fine on CoreOS. And so we're really not opinionated. It's just like etcd. Like mm -hmm. We built etcd because it's like it's a piece of technology that doesn't exist and there isn't a container runtime that uh, defines a standard for downloading things over the internet and runs in the current process space and we we wanted to build that and that's why we built it and we we're really not opinionated um, about if people take it and run it on Debian or Ubuntu we think that's great mm -hmm. do you plan to continue to contribute to docker yourself um, yeah it, We've been, um, if, if necessary, for doing bug fixes or additional features that yeah. um, people want. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, we also really like to see the app container um, spec be something that uh, can be pulled into Docker as well. Um, and I'm, I, I feel pretty good that that's something that might might, might happen. Okay. Well, Brandon, uh, is there anything else uh, you want to let us know about? Anything we should go look at? Uh, or if there's any resources you have for the audience, now would be a great time to bring any of that up. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of issues on GitHub that have help wanted tags. So if folks um, are familiar with Go and want to hack on stuff, there's a lot of interesting pieces that need to be built. Um, and uh, and the, the readme kind of does a good job of, of explaining how we've uh, architected Rocket into these stages. We've already seen really cool stuff. Uh, I got an email from a guy who's um, swapped out. We have uh, Rocket runs in these stages, and he has a stage that executes QMU KVM. So you your container essentially runs in a hypervisor, too. Hmm. So there's a lot of interesting things happening. Yeah. Well, uh, I was pretty excited when I saw the announcement. Reading the post, it sounds like you're addressing things I've been directly worrying about. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to see where the Rocket Project goes. And uh, I can't wait to play with it myself. Brandon, congratulations on the big news. Oh, yeah. Keep up the great work, and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I think a lot of you know I'm pretty excited about Fedora 21. It releases next week. There's a lot of goodies in it. I've already loaded it on one of my test rigs. But to talk a little bit more about it, returning to the show is Matthew Miller from the Fedora Project. Matthew, welcome back to the Linux Action Show. Hello. Thanks. I'm glad to be back. So uh, Fedora 21, are we on track for our Tuesday release? We are on track. This is my first release as Fedora Project nice. leader here, so I'm... Pretty... Extra nervous, I guess, but I think everything is going well. Knock on wood here. So, as we're so close to the to the release, what is it at this stage right now that kind of gives you a little uh, nervousness? Is it something about the distribution? Is it maybe last minute bugs? What's got you worried right now? Yeah, I think last minute bugs, like something <laughs> where thing we didn't didn't catch, and then I have to walk around with the brown paper bag. Uh, you, in fact, you were telling me on the live stream uh, that there was like a last minute like live CD font thing that had everybody uh, spun up for a minute, right? Yeah, and then you know, there's always a number of these kind of things because uh, a lot of our QA, you know, uh, is like last minute manual things, and you're running through it, and you're like, oh wait, I noticed this, and you have to make a judgment call about is this worth respinning the whole thing? <laughs> Makes sense. Um, <laughs> the developers, you know, working weekends and oh so yeah. On. Um, and try and balance all that, and then you have to say, okay, are we going to ship with the fonts bad, or are we going to delay the whole thing to Christmas time? Ah, so it's, wow. So uh, yeah. what do we, I think going in uh, for Fedora 21's release, uh, do I have to think about Fedora a little differently now? Because we're going to have three spins, right? Do I? So when I see that launch, when I see 21 hit, it, it, I need to know now there's three different versions I can grab, right? Yeah, so we've got a really nice new um, getfedora.org website. Oh, that's, I'll check it out. Um, oh, nice. Kind of like the, and I think that's live now with the upcoming content that kind of um, sets out these three flavors that we're promoting as the separate um, versions of Fedora. Uh, we've got Fedora Workstation, which is um, the most like the traditional Fedora desktop. Mm -hmm. It's GNOME-based, and it's uh, targeted a lot at um, 
software developers. And so we want to, um, you know, when you go to a conference these days, even a Linux conference, you've got everybody there with their MacBooks. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Really? Good. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we kind of we, we want to get those people back running desktop Linux, and we think that through our workstation will be really good for that particular audience. Um, that's, it's going that's to be, neat. yeah. Uh, so that's sort of the target, um, and of course, developers are people too. So that doesn't mean that it's going to be just like a developer only operating system. You know, they need to um, do all the things, browse the web, play music, all these things that everybody wants to do so it'll be good for that as well so fedora that's... workstation is sort of embracing the power user in a way yeah yeah and you know not necessarily the power user in the i've got to compile everything from right. scratch and right. those kind of things so the um but sort of the power user who wants you know wants a computer i've yeah. talked about that before i think yeah yeah i like that a lot uh and then you've got the you've got you've got some additions that are meant for server too right Right. So, yeah, so Fedora Server, uh, sort of the key feature of this is a thing called Cockpit, which is a, a web interface control, and a thing called Rollkit, which is a API for basically deploying something with a push button uh, that make this into an identity server, make this into a web server, make this into a database server. And with Fedora 21, we have a couple of those things, I think database server and identity server. Uh, and in the future, we're going to add some more curated collections of things. So it's more than just install a package. It's just set this up for me and make it all ready to go. And hmm. um, it's, I, I can keep talking at length, so interrupt me if I'm just going on. And no, on. no, this is great. So uh, um, <clears throat> when, I, when, I think about, when I think about the Fedora uh, over the years, I, I think one of the common criticisms I've had during my reviews was I wasn't quite sure what it was targeting, who it was, answer, who who the our audience was. Seems like you guys have a pretty solid answer for that now. Uh, so I, what what I want to do is probably bring you on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday and discuss more about that because I think uh, we can do some deep dives into the different versions and and talk about uh, how it's gone. So yeah. uh, before the release, is there anything else you want to let us know? Any any where should we watch? Just the Fedora website? Is there a Twitter account you plan to? Let people oh, yeah, know. yeah. Um, getfedora.org is going to be the site to get it from. Um, I think we've got the .com, too, to redirect. Um, <laughs> nice. We're, you know, we're, we're a proud .org, so that's the main site. Uh, yep, yep. And we do have a Fedora Twitter. Um, I think it's at Fedora. My goodness, I should know our own Twitter handle. Uh, I'll, you know what? I could search for it and put it in the show notes. Yeah. Oh, oh. That would be awesome. All right. um, and uh, you know, we, we'll, do, we'll do all the social media stuff. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to it, fedoraproject.org, and uh, good luck on the release on Tuesday. All right, we've been getting hot and heavy with server-related information and all kinds of stuff, so let's shake it all off and talk about something I'm really, really, really ridiculously excited about. It's been confirmed by 2K Games that Bioshock Infinite is coming to Linux in early 2015. Uh, right here on their very own Twitter feed, they say, Good news, Linux gamers. Bioshock Infinite is coming to Linux in early 2015. More details to come after the new year. I was I was hoping that I could maybe escape all family obligations and only play Bioshock <laughs> over the holiday, but no, that's fine. I mean, for those of you who haven't seen, I'm gonna just play a little clip here of the embedded trailer Pharonix has. It's a uh, very uh, so it's it it wow. takes place in a city in the air. Uh, the style, I, I don't even know how. How would you even describe the style? It's Apocalyptic with with a twist of uh, steampunk. Yeah, steampunk. Uh, yes, yes. Nineteen forties, twenty. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just just an incredible atmosphere. Uh, I I wanted to play this game so badly that I actually installed like the trial of Windows eight. Wow. And I got oh, a little is, ways into it. Badly. I couldn't bear Windows eight anymore, so I bailed. Yeah. And I've said I've I sat here thinking to myself since that time. If I only had it available for Linux, <laughs> I'm really excited about this. is awesome. one of those games that's for me. It's more. It's more exciting than going to a movie, wow. reading a book. It's just such a good game. At least I really liked it. Not yeah. everybody. Not it's not everybody's thing. It looks uh, awesome. I mean, I'll tell you. No word on who's doing the port yet. Uh, I I hope it's probably. I mean, I hope 2K Games will work with somebody who does a great job. But we'll keep an eye out for that and give you any news once we know more. I'm really excited. Good stuff. We saw it submitted to the Linux Action Show subreddit like four or five times. Uh, so <laughs> That tells you something right there. Yeah, and the Linux Action Show subreddit is your go-to resource, especially over the holiday weeks when the the news is slower. We could use your help, too. Mm -hmm. So go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com to submit stories for the show. All right, Matt, that's all the news for this week.
I'm looking forward to talking to Lenart because I think it's been the year of System D, so now that we're towards the end of it, it's great to sit down and chat with him. But first, I want to tell you about our segment sponsor, and that's the folks over at System76. System76 has computers built to run Linux, so that way when you install Linux, you're not fighting with drivers, wireless card problems, Bluetooth issues. Instead, you just get to play with the Linux. And, of course, it is the holiday season, and System76 is representing with a holiday special. You can get $100 off the Bonobo Extreme. That's my laptop that I've had for a couple of years. Go grab yourself something nice from System76. Stop fighting with the hardware. Start playing with your Linux. There's so much awesome software out there. It kind of doesn't make any sense to get all frustrated and turned off by Linux when you can just have a great experience. System76.com, now with lifetime support for Ubuntu, to lifetime support. That's pretty crazy. Okay, well, it's great to have Lenart on the show. Lenart, welcome to Linux Action Show, and uh, I've been wanting to talk to you all year. thought this is a great time to do it. Would you mind giving a brief introduction of who you are and where you work to the audience? Um, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Lenart Pettering. I uh, work for Rat Hat in the, in the uh, uh, development team, and I, I work on Systemd, uh, among other projects, um, but primarily in Systemd, and Systemd is quite large these days, so it's a lot of work. And um, I wrote the Avahi ZeroConf solution a few years back, um, like which was my first big project, and then I uh, worked on Pulse Audio, and um, that was my second big project, and Systemd is my third big uh, project now. So why don't we uh, sort of start, before we get into the Systemd stuff, uh, what, what do you do with the Pulse project in, today? Are you still involved with it? Unfortunately, not as much as I would like to. Um, like, it's, it's too much stuff. Uh, like, I mean, they, they, it has a, a couple of new maintainers now, and they are very good at looking at it. Um, but it's, I, I just unfortunately don't have the time. But, um, you know, with all the new stuff that's going on on the lower level of the system, um, I would actually be really interested in returning to it one day and, and making sure that uh, Pulse Audio can actually make use of all the little bits and pieces that we have introduced um, uh, since then. Um, like, uh, I'm not sure if you ever heard of the term KD bus, like something that we've be recently been working on. And that's actually, um, might mean not be obvious, but it's actually something that, that is incredibly useful if you want to write a, a sound server. So, um, uh, after we've done KD bus and all these kind of things would be actually be interesting returning, but no, I'm not really involved. In okay. That, uh, so you kind of keep an eye on it a little bit, but not, uh, directly involved anymore. Well, that's yeah, understandable. Subscribe. I'm subscribed to the mailing list, and but and my last commit is about a year ago. Oh, okay. Um, um, but, so uh, that was that was really one of your uh, first introductions to introducing a really big sweeping change to Linux, and uh, that brings and me. I got burnt. Yeah. <laughs> well, which is why when uh, I was impressed when you decided to take on the systemd initiative, sort of so publicly because of the experience with Pulse Audio, but maybe that that made you the perfect person for the job. But before we get too far into systemd, just for the audience that's kind of coming along for the first time. Maybe they've been living under a pretty big rock. Would, from a high level, would you mind explaining what System D is? So System D um, started out as an init system, as just an init system. Uh, the init system is basically responsible for bringing up the basic system. Like basically, you have the operating system kernel, and then the first process that the kernel in, uh, starts is that init system, and then the init system is responsible for bringing up the rest of the system. Um, and keeping track that all the component the components of the system actually stay up and and behave properly, and then ultimately are also can be shut down again, right? This is what it started out at, and what it was like a new concept there. Or actually, I mean, nothing that that system does is really inherently new. It's it's mostly about doing things that have been done elsewhere in a in a in a very um, unified um, systematic way. Um, but then after we did that basic. Um, initialization bit, we realized that that actually bringing up the system and keeping track of all the components and shutting it down again is not really enough of what we thought w would be necessary. And so we started to add a couple of more components of um, like that, that that are about system management, about hardware management, that, that about all like basically these glue bits that um, that are not in the kernel, that are not in the apps, but are right in the in the middle in between uh, the two. Um, and that everybody needs, right? Or at least 90% of the things need. So we moved a couple of things in there. So nowadays it, it is involved in IPC, like an in, in interprocess communication. It's involved in in hardware management. Like we added UDEF to it, if you, you might have heard of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the Linux hardware manager. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of other things, like it does logging. Um, logging it does because um, 
we think that logging is inherently part of service management and service management is like the biggest thing that system is responsible for because we believe that every single message that ever happens on the system and it, uh, that is printed by a service needs to be captured, needs to be um, verified, needs to be um, uh, um, queryable um, and in relation to that service, which is something that Unix so was it used to do. So early on in the uh, creation of System D, uh, in fact, I might have my timeline wrong. So you'd be the one to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I, I think when System D was sort of initi- initially getting developed, at that point in time, Red Hat Enterprise Linux was shipping with uh, Upstart, right? Uh, that is so I, I would imagine then, based on that, Red Hat probably took a pretty good look at Upstart internally to see if it could answer the needs and decided to go with System D. What? What was that? Was that pro- did that process happen? And what was sort of the deciding factor? Say, no, we're not going to take upstart. Not even a fork. Not even. Not even that. We're going to just start something new. Uh, so, what what led to that decision? And what did that process take place internally? So, in RHEL five, uh, which is a long time ago, mm-hmm. um, System five in it, like the traditional Linux in it, um, used to be uh, used. And then um, Red Hat engineers realized that this is probably not going to be the inner system of the future because it's uh, it's too simple. It doesn't keep track of services, even though keeping track of services should really be at the, the core of, of, of service management. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they looked around, and the only other um, open source Linux-ish implementation there was was Upstart. And Upstart is miles better than, than System 5 in it. Right? So they adopted that for RHEL 6, um, simply because it was the only option. Um, however, um, me and, um, and a couple of other people, we always thought that, that Upstart, like from its most basic design, actually was backwards. Right? Um, so it didn't ask the question like, I need to start this, now let's figure out what is needed to start that. But instead, what it did is it reacted to that something else was started and then would, would try figuring out what else it needs to start which we believed was the wrong way around because it always maximizes uh, what is started at the system instead of minimizes mm. and uh, and a couple of other things like because it's modular and in, in these kind of things so um we always believed it was wrong it was still better than system 5 init because system 5 init um is an init system that that i mean it, system 5 init used to be an init system that was designed in the in the basically in the 80s when hardware was not hot pluggable when the system was basically completely static Right, and Upstart did this big jump so that it was dynamic and could deal with uh, things coming and going and things like that. But again, we believed that it inherently was the wrong way around. That's why we proposed SystemD then, because SystemD is a lot more complex actually than Upstart. I mean, something that is nice about Upstart is actually its simplicity, um, because there is no engine inside of uh, Upstart that figures out what really to do. Instead, you write everything out manually and just tell it, yeah, if this happens, then do that. While in SystemD, it's it's always like, okay, this has been asked for me. Now let me figure out what I precisely need to do to reach that um, uh, point. But where is I that can provide that this. very complexity? Is that what enables things like? I'm guessing, but socket activation or restarting an NFS mount when the network connection resumes? Um, well, the NFS thing is, is nothing that I would use as an example. But Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's about this dynamic thing. So Upstart delivered this better. Like, Upstart, oh, but it always did too much, right? Like, it, it always um, pushed um, the system into, like, um, if the network is up, um, then it would do everything that was possible. Uh, the, like it would mount the NFS stuff, it would um, mm-hmm. do this and that and that and that, everything that's possible, even if nobody actually asked for that and nobody actually pulled that in. Right. And, and that's but because it, in System D, the, there's an engine that does that logic on its own? Yeah. So okay. in, in, in System D, hence a lot of complexity. It's like it's graph theory, if you ever dealt with mass, it's like it's where they have this network of, of units and they have dependencies and then. Um, we try to derive an initial transaction, like a subset of this stuff that we figure out that is necessary following these dependencies. Then we check if these dependencies are contradictory, and then we invoke this, right? So this is like, this is mass, this is like non-trivial um, stuff. I mean, it's not that difficult either, but it's, it's, it's not as simple as Upstart in that regard, which was the simple rule engine. Um, anyway, we proposed that, and uh, we believe that it was the more correct solution would actually deal uh, like like solve the real problem because i mean inherently what's at the root of it is um should it be the computer that figures out what to do at boot or should it be the developer or admin that figures it out and writes it down so that the computer just executes it and our opinion was always well computing is about 
computing, right? It should be the computer that figures it out and minimizes it every single time and does it in the best possible way. It should not be the admin's job or the developer's job to, to, to actually Do write this down. Do you think perhaps that, that core design philosophy is what the some people in the community are grading against at a fundamental level? Is is that they just disagree with that premise? Um, yes, absolutely. It's it's like um, systemd in this regard is a lot more automatic and, and, and tries to, to help the admin by taking away work from him in a way. And of course, uh, many admins don't like that because traditionally it didn't used to be that way. Traditionally, it was really the admin that was in power and he could actually, like he could go through, through the shell scripts and, and would easily understand the state machine that System 5 in it was implementing mm -hmm. and um, could immediately follow what, what precisely it was doing because it was he who actually selected it. However, um, in, I inherently believe that today's systems don't work like that where this is really possible anymore because, I mean, we nowadays have systems where hard has come and go and things like 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 that. So if you if you if you if you look at the boot process, what actually needs to happen there? It's something where like the hardware needs to 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 be probed. Then um, as the hard disks are being probed, we need to file system check them. Then when that's complete, we need to mount them. Hmm. And when then that happened for all the file systems altogether, then we can uh, look and start the first service and things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And in this kind of complexity, it's really difficult to write down in a generic way that actually can deal with, with all kinds of system where, where some hard disks might be plugged in via USB, the other one comes via iSCSI, and the third one comes via SATA. It's right, like this, this traditional scheme where everything was static and where you could actually write down the rules um, brings you quite far, but it will not solve the problem of today's computing because today's computing is so intensely more complicated than, than they used to be in the 80s and the early Right. 80s. When I think of the old system, I, I try to envision a way where it could be competitive on a mobile device um, or competitive in, say, uh, like a service provider like AWS or DigitalOcean that deploys thousands of instances a day. Uh, I, I struggle to see how th we could be competitive in that area without something like System D. And is, is that sort of the need that Red Hat saw? And is that why this became a Red Hat initiative? Um, so actually, Red Hat initially was not very enthusiastic about really? the idea that we did this. Oh, right? interesting. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people always assume that this was Red Hat's decision, and yeah. then, then um, they put us on the job and we did this. It's really not that way. It's like um, uh, um, we saw that we could do it better than Upstart, um, and that we inherently, like from the, from the basic concepts on, we could do it better than Upstart. So we did this, and my manager actually explicitly told me not to back then. Um, <laughs> But we saw that, okay, this is not, not like the other problem was that Upstart was moving at glacial speeds at that at that time, and we needed something better there. So we said, okay, this is what we do, um, what we propose, and then I blogged about it, and then um, we managed to actually convince more and more people. So eventually, the managers at Red Hat said, okay, things change. Now we understand why you want this. Um, then we convinced all the technical people in Fedora and the technical people in the RHEL. Um, side of things, and they all eventually agreed, well, systemd is the best thing there. Um, there were long discussions inside of Red Hat, there were long discussions outside of Red Hat, um, and then eventually they said, okay, yeah, it's systemd that should be, the, uh, should, should be um, used there. And then we, we made the change, and um, uh, then it went on from there into the other distributions, like SUSE adopted it, and, and Arc Linux adopted it, and now what, there's even Debian. What is different about systemd's development process that uh, something kind of quote-unquote so new could be put into such a, an important production system like Red Hat Enterprise Linux. How did you guys approach it so that it would essentially be production ready so early? I mean, I realize it had some development time before it hit RHEL, but even still, in, the, in terms of an enterprise distribution, adopting something this fundamental, quote-unquote, that early, is, a, is not exactly a precedent. So did, was there something from the beginning that you did to make sure that when it hit, it was ready? I would not underestimate how old systemd is nowadays because it's four years, like more than four years now, okay. right? And RHEL 7 was released earlier this year, so it was more than like three and a half years old when, when RHEL 7 was actually yeah, fair released. Fair enough, yeah. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, we try to, to it, it's really, it boils down to bugs. Uh, like, does your software do what, what is requested from it? And, and Red Hat has internally all these Q&A things. Um, where um, software is tested and and um, bugs are filed, and the the goal, of course, was to make sure that we are we don't have the bugs um, that make this impossible, and um, we somehow managed to pull that off, right? Like 
uh, we made sure that our software was in a good shape. And uh, I can tell you in the RHEL 7 circle, actually, Systemd was one of the uh, uh, projects that had very little bugs to deal with. Mm. And that, that uh, um, were one of the, 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 the quickest things to, to get the check off that, that everything was fine with it. Very cool. So, um, I mean, it's, it's like we have, we have a coding style that is very um, strictly enforced, I guess. Mm. And uh, um, yeah, I don't know. We have good code review. Um, it's really like we have a lot of committed. Like, I mean, um, I actually realized yesterday that's 26 committers now. And um, they are, are doing good work to making sure that the stuff that enters, I mean, it's it's like in the kernel, yeah. right? Like the kernel manages to pull push out a new release every half year, and it's usually pretty okay quality. And, so uh, um, why don't yeah. we talk a little bit about that? Because uh, the other thing is, is I think it is predominantly considered a Red Hat only project. But is that really oh, uh, no. an affair, a fair assertion these days? No, no, no. It, 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 like it, it initially, it even wasn't at all. Like uh, because um, I worked together with Kai Sivas on it, and Kai Sivas back at that day uh, was actually a SUSE employee. He's now a Red Hat employee okay. too. Yeah. Like it ended up that we hired a lot of people for Red Hat who 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 uh, were working on Systemd. That's but awesome. But even today. Um, from the 26 people or something that have commit access, um, I think l maybe less than a half, like um, 10 or 12 or something, I actually read Hat on, please. Oh, really? And we have people... We have people from 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 Canonical. I mean, not many people know that. Like mm -hmm. uh, that, actually, Canonical people had commit access to Systemd even when there was still the big discussion on um, whether whether Ubuntu should adopt Systemd. And and, and Mark Shuttleworth said, ah, oh, Systemd never, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Even then, um, I think um, most at Canonical didn't even realize that actually people from that uh, uh, company had commit access to, to Systemd already. Like. Um, and then there are people from Intel and 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 um, people from from all the various companies who build stuff with Linux that nowadays have commit access. For us, and and there's actually a good part is is actually community people who have no affiliation to any company. Um, sure. But for us, it always was um, really an exercise in giving up control. Um, because what we saw, like one of the big issues with Upstart actually was was about control. Canonical really tried hard to keep um, everything in control um, in Upstart because they thought this was um, like supposed to be this big component that is at the core of all the operating systems. And if they own it, um, then this would give them a better position in something. Like so, they invented, um, uh, like they 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 enforced um, this copyright assignment uh, uh, thing, which is something like I mean you can do it and it's it's completely legitimate if you do, but it also has the effect of completely um, right. destroying your community. Was that in play back at the uh, origination of System D? Was that? Was that in play? Well, only? sure, it was one of the reasons. But okay. I mean, inherently okay. for us, what matters most was that conceptually we thought the design was wrong about sure. that. Right. But um, it, it certainly it, it doesn't help projects if they have copyright assignment. Um, yes. Like, um, what what's really important if you want to get contributions is that you make the contributions easy to make and um, like what I call drive-by patches. Um, like people who just notice that something is wrong or could be improved and then they prepare a patch and send it to you. That's what you want. Like this is what you really rely on because it gives you this this kind of polishing that you need for your project. But if you do copyright assignment, of course, then you can forget right. it because this would mean that people would actually have to sign a, a, a contract basically right. with you that, that um, you, they grant you the rights and you grant them back and things like that. So um, for us, um, like Canonical really tried to keep the, the, the lid on that, right? Like they, they really tried to make sure that Upstart stays own, a property of, of Canonical. Hence, we always thought we should do the entire opposite, like like the Linux kernel does mm -hmm. that too, right? Like they do not require copyright assignment and make a project that's really, really open, right? So where it's not just Kai and me and the few who are in power, um, but actually where, where um, people actually have commit access who are not us um so like to, to to i mean there is this criticism that that basically the bus factor thing that if, if Kai and i would go away or something that we would have a problem but we try everything in, in that we can do to make sure that this is not an issue and uh, as mentioned since since uh, um yesterday or something we have 26 committers now um just to make sure that yeah everybody's in control and it's an open source project and um, mm -hmm. it's really about contributing good patches and not really about anything else not about copyright or, or things like so that that make it do you want to let's do you want to talk about a couple of common things that I hear when we talk about system D on our shows because uh, you just mentioned one of them though what happens when Lenart goes away but I think that's kind of obvious what would probably happen if after a while it's an open source project uh, so here's the here's the number two common thing I hear about system D that people are concerned about and uh, it's one that I've I've repeated from time to time thinking perhaps this is true 
And uh, I think you probably have a pretty good answer for it, but I want to answer, ask it anyways. A lot of people will say System D adds a common attack surface across most Linux distributions. Its commonality could be its downfall if there is if there is a fatal flaw or an insecure uh, component in System D. It could be across all of the distributions. What are your thoughts on on that critique? Well, I, I don't really believe that much in that. Um, I, I, sure, it is, a, it is a problem that if you have a monoculture, of course, uh, you make like if you find a vulnerability, um, then you own the entire monoculture. But um, then again, I don't know. I, I think that unification of code actually has um, benefits um, for security because it's actually it's less code to, to look at um, and more people looking at it, right? Like because everybody uses that stuff. Um, and as it turns out, we have a real problem that um, code review is 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 not a regular thing, right? Like we should really um, make sure that we have as little code um, and have as many people as possible mm -hmm. look at that, because we have so many, uh, so few people actually doing that. Um, and then the other thing is like, um, what system does is like we want to fight security problems with security technology in a way. So um, uh, we offer a lot of functionality to secure down services. Um, uh, to make sure that um, if you're on system, do you actually get a more secure system than you wouldn't? Like, um, if, for example, I don't know, there's this like options. Like, if you have run a service on system, do you can actually with very easy options uh, lock it down so that it cannot write to the operating system, like to slash USR anymore, um, or that it cannot see the home directories anymore. Like, because um, I mean, if you run um, some some MySQL, why should it be able to ever have access to your home directory and things like that? Sure. So um, we added like lots. Of security features. Actually, um, I, just uh, a, a week ago, I gave a, a talk at um, at, a, at a conference in, in, in the Netherlands that was just about these security features and um, of system. The, the the video is actually online if you're interested. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a link in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and it's just like um, I'm pretty sure. Like I, for for me personally, security matters a lot. It's it's really an essential thing to, to do. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think that the best way to achieve security is by minimizing code pass and to, because I mean, currently um, in, in traditional Unix, um, what you see is that, that a lot of co code how services initialize is copied over and over and re-implemented over and over again into the various daemons. Um, usually this code is not very good. And um, if it's implemented by 100 times in a bad way, then it's much, much worse if we have it um, uh, than when we would have it in one way in system D that is closely mm -hmm. vetted that everybody has, um, like a lot of people had to log, uh, look at and that we made sure that it's in a, in, a, in a good condition. So I guess the other so, most uh, that that makes sense, and also you know taking advantage of some new features like uh, namespaces and the way it can the way it works so perfectly with a lot of the container technologies, which also brings a whole other level of security is is something you can't discredit. But I think the thing that people the, you know the other thing you've probably heard a lot of times is it's not the Unix way. It's not the, you know, Unix is a lot of little tiny tools working together uh, with a series of magical pipes. Um, what is your response to that common one? Um, as a fir first of all, I would actually argue that it is the Unix way in many, many ways. Um, like, for example, it exposes services as files, right? Like, you know, this Unix mantra, which I actually don't buy that much um, of everything's a file. Um, actually, system that goes in that direction uh, quite a bit because it ex exposes services as a file, and in the C group file system, you can actually browse it with your with your shell. You can just CD into the directory where you see all the running services, and you can do cat and see the the PIDs and things like that. So, in a way, you could say it goes in much closer into the direction. Um, of, of Unix than, than the traditional stuff does. But I mean, ultimately, I don't really want to be involved too much in the discussion if it's Unix or not. Um, mm. The thing is, um, uh, Unix is a inspiration for us. It's, it's, a, it's probably the greatest inspiration for us. Um, but I think it's also an operating system that was designed in the early 70s. Uh, and it's not, it's not how today's computers really work, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, you cannot expect users um, who are used to graphical user inf interfaces to pipe things and pipelines and things like that. I mean, it's a great concept, and I'm pretty sure, I mean, I use it all the time because I'm a developer and I know computers. Right. Yeah. But it's also not how you would do a modern UI, right? Like, sure. if you go to web browser, it's not built from pipelines, right? Right, yeah. So, um, uh, I, so I would say, yeah, it's actually, in many ways, it's very Unix. Um, and I also believe that that many people actually don't know what Unix actually is. Would, because do you think we should just stop we, having that debate? To be honest with you, is it just time for that debate to go away? 
I, I, I don't know. I don't really care too much about if it's Unix or not. It's, yeah. it's, it's like if people want to spend their time. I, what I would like to go away is, is the misinterpretations of what Unix actually was. Because mm. um, we heard, hear those claims that Unix was about portability and that Unix was about um, having multiple implementations of everything, things like that. But that's explicitly not what it's about. Like if you, if you look at the actual Unixes that are around still, Linux is not a Unix, by the way. It's just something Linux, uh, Unix compatible in many ways. Um, but the actual Unix is like FreeBSD and, and OpenBSD and uh, Solaris and these kind of things. Right. They actually, like portability um, is, is an ownership for them. Like, like for example, OpenSSH, like the thing that everybody uses, the version that OpenBSD writes and maintains um, is not portable. Right, like there's a, another a, a separate group of people who actually make it portable. Then they, they do the p releases, the portable releases. But ultimately, most of the Unix software is inherently not portable. Like for example, if you look at SMF, which is the systemd counterpart that Solaris um, is shipping, um, it uses uh, it, quite a few concepts of Solaris that are not part, portable. Like they have these um, how do you call them uh, project IDs, uh, how they keep track of services. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that it does not exist on Linux, and they don't care because they write operate an operating system. That is that is supposed to be one operating system that makes where where the kernel offers functionality and user space makes the best out of it. Um, so I think often when people claim that systemd was not Unix, what they actually mean is systemd is not the way Linux used to be because an, an, it was a Linux thing where everything was maintained independently. Like uh, because in FreeBSD, for example, or or the other BSDs too, we actually uh, find that that the kernel, that the libc, that uh, most of the user space tools, all sit in the same rep repository, right? Um, and we are often criticized for the fact that we put a certain glue bits um, all in the same repository in, in systemd. And if people tell us that we weren't Unix, then I can just tell you, well, uh, we are a lot less the way that you think that Unix is then yeah I mean if we would yeah. stick the kernel and Lipsy also in the system D tree that would be real Unix any uh, I'm pretty sure that people don't might mean that right what people people do mean is the fact that Linux traditionally used to be something where everything was split up among yeah. a multitude of projects and right. badly maintained or differently maintained different life cycles and things like that <laughs> well I suppose but, that's definitely one way to look at it and uh, it's kind of how I always looked at it but I thought uh, that it was such a common one I heard that I wanted to give you a chance to respond to it. And any quick thoughts on uh, uh, John Hubbard recently mentioning that uh, FreeBSD is going to be looking at a system similar to LaunchD or SystemD, and he kind of even up on stage at MeetBSD said, "Look, the, the even the even the Linux guys see the need." Any thoughts on that? Well, it's great. I mean, it's like you know um, when we wrote SystemD, um, we we always like one of the biggest things we did before was do our homework and figure out what does everybody else do. Like, what does Solaris do with SMF? What does LaunchD like MacOS do with LaunchD? Uh, what do the BSD guys do? What does everybody else do? And we spend a lot of time um, uh, uh, for that. And that's like SystemD is just the the combination of all the good features that we found there, and it. It was a bit disappointing that we cannot do that anymore because, um, like all the other competitors, kind of like like SMF didn't have anything interesting. Like I mean, Solaris moves at glacial speeds; they 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 are basically in maintenance mode, and and there's nothing new coming in SMF. Um, Upstart is is mostly completely dead. I think that the last commit they did was half a year ago. Um, uh, launch D, like the stuff that Apple's doing, nothing new is being added there. Um, so we kind of like the like it's just us now, and um, we of course can can. Um, um, come up with new things, but I, I think that a, a healthy um, ecosystem probably needs some competition. So I, I would love it if uh, if FreeBSD would actually do something there, and, and I'm pretty sure they come up with good ideas that might be something we want to steal from them. Um, uh, and, and they can steal <laughs> you know, stuff from yeah, us. Absolutely. I think it would be great. Yeah. Uh, so I have a I have like one more kind of question. Then I have a few audience Q and A uh, questions I want to get to, and then we'll we'll wrap up here in a bit. But uh, shifting away from System D and just sort of touching last System D question I have for you. Uh, has some of the negative reaction discouraged you from maybe launching another ambitious project in the future that would sort of usher in a lot of change? And I have one in particular I want to ask you about. But just before we leave, leave System D, does it give you pause the reaction you've gotten? Well, I mean, for some reason, it doesn't affect me too much. I mean, um, it's like uh, I know that 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 other people, if they get the opposition that we got, um, will react in different ways and just wonder like, why the fuck am I doing this? And then just um, step away from it and, and try to find something else yeah, where they do out. not get so much. Yeah, but 
Um, I don't know. For some reason, I'm not like that. Like, um, I, 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 I care a lot about criticism, but f for some reason, I only care about the criticism from people where, where I really like trust them. The one where you right? sense like, it's accurate. Well, if it's accurate or not, right. it's, it's another question. Well, okay. still, but, um, <laughs> gotcha. Just you, um, you trust from the the source of the opinion. Um, yeah, okay, like it, it, that's, yeah. that's fair. Uh, so um, no, it will not stop me. No, <laughs> that, that, like I, I, I like uh, then, then again, I mean, Systemd is a huge project, and it, it's it's one of those open-ended projects because you never can say now it's complete or something right. because there will always be something. It needs to grow with with how IT grows yeah. and, and gets new features and new concepts and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So um, I don't see any new project coming up. Like if we do something new, then within the Systemd project, but but nothing. Well, so uh, here's what I kind of wanted to pick your brain about, and I'm sure it's not even really on the forefront. Of your mind because you're probably pretty busy on system d but before we get to the q a the question i had for you uh is i've seen you blog and i think maybe you did a presentation or, su or such on um distributing software on linux using perhaps containers or maybe even uh, sub volumes uh could you expand on that a little bit because it seems to me like let's just say we're in a future where system d is pretty well established everybody's pretty moved along and it's it's pretty it's pretty well uh, uh used at this point it seems like one of the big things still facing linux is a sensible software distribution that works on everything is that something you've been thinking about um yeah that's pretty much what the proposal is about like we realized the problem that like the people who write software for Linux are the same people who write Linux in, in, in a way. Like we are an ecosystem that that has trouble um, um, finding people who are not part of the ecosystem anyway to actually write software for us. I mean, mm. some do. Like um, I don't know, Mozilla, for example, they 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 write Firefox, and and while they're part of the open source community, I don't think they're so much part of the Linux community in a way. Um, but they have serious troubles with actually um, shipping that stuff, right? Like um, because they re rely on the distributions to actually pick it up, and then distributions um, uh, have different life cycles, right? Like for example, if they if Firefox tries to get their stuff into into Debian, then this basically means that that they need to wait two years before it actually hits um, <laughs> the end users, right? Like um, it's it's a real problem that these the the it's it's then out of the control of the folks who write the software and in the control of the distributions, yes. which is nothing necessarily to be to be wrong, but it's certainly not the stuff that that upstream right. app developers It doesn't want. put, like, like they, for they, example, OwnCloud in the best light when you're installing a two-year or three-year-old version of OwnCloud yeah. in Debian. Exactly, yeah. It's, 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 um, they want much uh, faster release cycles than, than mm -hmm. the distributions are usually willing um, to provide. Um, and that is something you cannot resolve, right? Like, you cannot um, um, stay with the old model, really, um, and 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 still provide um, a life cycle um, releases that that, that are um, much much quicker. Um, and it's also the the issue is bugs, right? Like um, um, the Mozilla people are probably completely willing to deal with the bugs. They don't need the distributions to deal with bug mm -hmm. reports um, uh, for them. So and they they also the, they, I mean there's also a licensing question I'm personally not too much interested in in, in allowing closed source software to run on Linux but then again I also understand that people want that but um, uh, yeah anyway so, so all these things together kind of push us to this um, direction where we need to think about well if we ever want to have a platform where it's really, really interesting for people to write software for, because I mean, um, look at Android, what, what Android managed to do in no time, mm -hmm. um, create an ecosystem. Um, and we should be able to actually jumpstart something similar. Then we actually maybe need to make alterations to distribution methods. Um, however, of course, the distribution model is actually awesome. Like, I mean, um, it, it, it gives you software all vetted from a single hand in the its, in, 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 in its same life cycle. This can actually also be a good thing. Like, it's, it's just a matter of perspective. So what we try to figure out is, is maybe a way how we can um, uh, unite these two models, right? Like, so that the base OS strictly follows the distribution rules. Um, and um, you file box to the distribution, like all the, the QA stuff. Including the, their existing package manager? Um, sure. Like, if distributions want to do a, a package manager, they can. Okay. Although, I would actually probably not make this strict. Um, um, uh, not restriction. necessarily. I though. mean, the stuff that, that that we try to design is it works with or without a package manager, right? Okay. Like, because, like, um, I don't know if, if you if you look at, at things like Chrome OS, 
which is an operating system that doesn't have a package manager, right? right. Like they install apps on top of that, but the, the base OS is absolutely the same on every single Chrome OS instance. And this is the model that I think should be something we, we can support with, with Linux out of the box, where, where you have the core OS that is fixed, and then you install apps on that. So, so, so um, I don't know. What, what we try to do is kind of to, to open up the classic distribution model in a way that you can also run apps that um, uh, if, have, can come in any cycle, that um, have, like, uh, make use of the same ABIs and APIs on every single instance where they're running. Um, like, this is another big problem for, for Firefox, for example. If they want to um, ship software, um, then they, on Linux, currently have this problem that they would actually have to do that, like, like they have to ship it as a dev file for, for Debian, mm -hmm. as a slightly different compiled dev file for Ubuntu. They have to ship it as an RPM for Fedora. Um, and then for 16 and 17 and 18, they would actually have to, to, to build different versions because GTK is in a different version and they want integration to these kind of things. So they, they have this general problem that they don't know what precisely to develop against. And if they want to develop against everything, like the entire Linux ecosystem, this would basically mean building their software um, uh, 50 times or something and for the different versions, for the different um, uh, distributions and, and things like that. Right. So um, we kind of want to provide a way there where you have multiple runtimes installed and they can choose one runtime and um, Would that be a container? That. What would that look like? Um, like a runtime is basically just a set of libraries uh, in so a very just specific Sort of version. like how Steam does it today where they have a set of, like they have an Ubuntu runtime environment with every Steam installation. But this would be system-wide for all apps just so they have something to expect, libraries to depend on? Um, yes, and but the, the the crucial bit is actually that we would allow multiple of these runtimes to to be around at the same time. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, which basically means you can have uh, if Fedora defines the runtime, you can have the the Fedora twenty, the Fedora twenty one, Fedora twenty two runtimes mm. installed at the same time, and you get the exact same libraries and the exact same versions um, installed in parallel, and you can um, run programs that are linked against any of these. And but it's it, it doesn't actually stop at the distributions. Our idea was even that GNOME would provide a runtime, like they would. Um, uh, provide the GNOME 3.0 runtime and the GNOME 3.2 uh, runtime, the GNOME 3.4 runtime. It always would be an update in, in features, but you can install all of them parallel. And if you run an app, um, uh, you can run it um, against any of these. And you, you, KDE would have an, a runtime as well. You could install the KDE runtime and the GNOME runtime at the same time. And then the, and then the GNOME project would be responsible for potentially security fixes to that runtime environment and things like that? Yes. Um, okay. So, um, like, uh, my recommendations, of course, um, like, this is probably a burden that GNOME doesn't want to take. So my recommendation would always be uh, make that actually built on, on what the classic distributions do, right? Like, um, and if the distributions, um, they have all the, 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 the work in, in, pr in working uh, where they do updates, security updates. Like, for example, if, if there's a bug in OpenSSL, then, of course, the distributions already will update OpenSSL for mm -hmm. you. Hence, it would be a good idea that if GNOME wants to put together runtime, they would actually build on that and just use the distribution packages um, to build the runtime. And then they can see, okay, Debian did a security update of OpenSSL, so we just um, click one button here and update the uh, GNOME runtime um, to um, taking those packages into, into um, okay. consideration. That makes sense. Uh, all right. So, and is this delivered? Uh, so, this is delivered using standard tools today, or is there a new delivery system for these runtimes and the applications that would sit on top of those? So, uh, in, in general, none of the stuff that I was talking about um, really exists. Like, we have a couple of, of things, of right. basic building blocks um, to, to um, right. fix first, like uh, for the containerization. It's a, it's a huge project to, to make this all work um, all the way through the stack. Very so that, early that, days, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, basically my idea is that um, we would use um, as transfer uh, Butterfly snapshots or file system deltas. I mean, it doesn't have to be strictly Butterfly snapshots. It's, it's more about the, butter, uh, the, the, the file system deltas so that you can actually know like the stuff that was added and then, then you can replay them on the, on the other side sure. so that it's sure. a bit for bit exact image right. of what you originally had. Is that similar in, in theory to the OS X DMG? Like when you download software on OS X, you get a file system image that you mount and then copy the data out of. Well, but it's DMGs as far as I know. I mean, I'm not a Mac user that I'm, much. Um, but uh, um, uh, DMG files are, are, are full images. They're not deltas, right? Like, um, okay. And this scheme is really about deltas so, okay. so that we have a nice way how to, to update things and without always um, 
doing the same, like uh, downloading the real right. of the full image again and again and again and yeah, again. That's but nice. Only what actually changed. And then because we actually have the deltas, we can actually uh, put them in, in file system snapshots and, and give them different labels so that you can actually switch force and back, right? Which is an important feature because um, uh, I, I want to come to a system where the system, when it realizes that something goes wrong, can automatically roll back to the old version. Because that, that's something that, that um, uh, RPMs and, and DEBs never could provide. That is, if you do an upgrade and something goes wrong, and it will because it's very difficult to test um, Debian and RPM upgrades in every combination, and the distribution generally don't, then you have no way to actually get back to a working system unless you are an educated administrator that can figure out and knows Unix and, right. and, and knows uh, or Linux and know, knows um, how to fix things. So I think it's absolutely essential if we want to push um, Linux into into being an operating system that everybody can use, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we need more automatic handling of these mis this errors. And that means that if an upgrade doesn't work or if the if the the, the binary that you downloaded was actually broken in, on, on some systems or things like that, that there's a nice way how the system either automatically or on user demand can just roll back to the previous versions. And you can actually then have a couple of versions back right. Uh, right. Uh, around. And yeah. you can have these versions around both for the apps and for the operating system itself. right? Like if you notice that the new version of LibreOffice always crashes if you add an arrow to your impress uh, slide, right. Right. then you can say, okay, whatever, I'll just roll back to the It seems to like a system like that would make uh, rolling Linux distributions or more frequently updated distributions a little safer in the sense when you have that uh, safety net, which makes me think of security fixes, like those kinds of things would benefit. All right, I I've got a couple of audience questions for you, and then we'll wrap up. So uh, Blackout24 asked on our subreddit, he wanted to know, this is geeky, what is the reasoning behind the system deversioning system, like 2.17, 2.18, instead of something more familiar like with the kernel, say 2.34.1? He says, wouldn't the traditional scheme have made it easier to identify big changes, maybe API changes, etc.? Um, so, uh, like when we adopted this, we actually just took the old version scheme of UDEF, and, uh, which is just linear, and it doesn't have any sub major minor versions and things like that. Uh, the reason is that we wanted to, to keep a, uh, um, a fast pace, right? Like, mm. so that we um, do very frequent releases, like ideally every two weeks or something. Actually, we are not uh, currently delivering that, like, um, it takes a little bit longer, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, but uh, um, it, it's, it was supposed to be. And, and, and still is supposed to be this this uh, system thing that you build your stuff on, but that grows um, incrementally in small steps instead of having like these big releases that change everything. That right? makes sense because it seems like as the project gets more widespread, I've worried that perhaps not that I don't really think this is a problem, but it seems like if it got so large and a lot of things started to depend on it, it could become too risky to change too much at once. So is is this sort of so, a long term fix for that? Kind of a long term way to address that? Yeah, so, so so the way how we introduce new components, uh, for example, is that we add them in one version, but uh, tell people that it's probably not the version, like that mm. you don't really want to rely on this part of it, but here you have it, and uh, let's get uh, testing started. And then as we progress, um, uh, it keeps being updated. When finally we have the idea that this component is stable, now we will actually let people know. Okay. And there's actually, like, there's a, there's a wiki page that lists exactly what is stable and what isn't. Um, so uh, it's like, yeah, the idea is that we have a continuous stream of small fixes where new features are slowly introduced and uh, you get a lot of small features all the time, but very little big features uh, abruptly. Um, and then, um, yeah, and that's how it goes on. But uh, mm -hmm. like, I mean, there will be places where we will make bigger cuts. Sure. Like we know that already, like for KDBus, um, and of course it would be great if we wouldn't have to do that, but it's, it's actually so complicated that we probably will do the step where we will have one big break in, the, in the, one of the next releases where we'll actually make a hard re uh, requirement on a specific kernel version and things like that. But uh, the usual stream is lots of small things all the time and slow adoption of new features. So uh, KD Bus is actually going to be one of my next questions, but uh, Blackout had a second part to his question. He wants to know if you have any special plans for version 666. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> still a long time out, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is. That's very true. Well, maybe something a little more uh, nerd, near term. Uh, one of the other questions that came in is, uh, what are some of the benefits and workload performance gains that people should expect or look forward to with KDBus being con connected? And what does that mean? What is bringing KDBus in and why is that a big deal? So, I mean, if you do KDBus right, then actually nobody will notice anything about it. Um, it is mostly something that makes things faster and easier 
and, and nicer for developers, right? Um, so um, if you're lucky, you might notice that the system boots faster, but I, I wouldn't expect that, and it's not really uh, about that so much. Uh, but it's inherently really something that is interesting for developers and for system builders, um, because it, it resolves a lot of things that the problems that we have at the lower level, uh, lower layers, like, like for example, I don't know, um, currently Dbus um, IPC is only viable in late boot, not in early boot. Um, which is actually a big problem because, like, if, if if the machine boots up early, then there are lots of components that want to talk to each other, but they cannot use Dbus because Dbus is only around in late boot. This entire complexity goes away with KDBus because KDBus is something that's available in the kernel, and hence, like, it's available from the initial instant the, right. the system um, invokes in it, basically, all the way to the very, very end, and everybody can just con communicate. And this is actually really, really important because IPC, like the, the, the ability between uh, of processes to talk to each other, is, is so at the core of everything that we do when we bring up the system. Um, so, um, yeah, again, like, like for end users, I mean, we have a, have a much nicer... Um, uh, uh, tool set that we ship with systemd now that exposes uh, dbus functionality i mean dbus has this problem that that it's kind of uh, opaque to people who didn't spend the time actually mm -hmm. looking um, and, and trying to understand the concepts right like like um I, I think somebody in an lwn comment actually called that stuttering yeah. um the way um how you invoke uh, bus calls for example because it's not obvious to people the, these concepts that that uh, the Dbus brings like interfaces and methods and, and, and object paths and service names and these kind of things. So um, I think if we um, make Dbus more and more as a center of IPC of, of Linux, we need to also make sure that it's a lot more um, introspectable, uh, transparent to the administrator, right? Mm. Um, so that they're not lost if they're sitting in front of, 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 of Dbus and then now need to um, learn all the different concepts that show up there. So we spend a lot of time in, in making sure that this is more understandable. And so we have uh, some tools like Bus Control, something that we recently added, that allows you to introspect Dbus and, and hopefully makes um, Dbus a lot more understandable administrators so that they, because they are, it's actually incredibly useful because you can use it to, to uh, execute operations from scripts and things like that, like for it's 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 like I mean administrators in in a big time um, try to script the systems and if you suddenly have all the stuff that Dbus opens up um, accessible from your scripts, that's 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 fantastic. So um, hmm. anyway, so this is a facet where admins at least will hopefully see bus yeah, uh, uh, yeah. KDbus a bit more because it comes along with a lot of uh, new tools but ultimately um, if you if you're a user who just uses web browsers if we do everything right you will know, notice nothing about it <laughs> right that's I think that'll make some people feel good too uh, so uh, there's uh, it seems like uh, a lot a lot could be changing over the next few years with new ways to distribute software, uh, containerization, systemd rolling out. Uh, where do you see things going, say, uh, four or five years down the road? And and also, uh, I you know you start with the Avahi project and then Pulse Audio and then systemd is such a it's such a server thing uh, compared to those which seem to be more desktop focused. At the heart, are you are you a are you a Linux desktop user for the long term? I and mean, what's your plan there? Do you hope to see Linux in five years being a really competitive alternative desktop operating system? Your thoughts? Well, I mean, the thing that drives me is actually that I think I want to have a good computer that just works. And um, I used to be part, actually, for the longest time working at Red Hat of the desktop group at Red Hat. Mm. Um, I, I only recently uh, changed to the group that's called Server Experience. Um, uh, uh, um, and I'm not strictly a desktop guy anymore. Um, but then again, I mean, I use Linux exclusively for development. I, I, I run GNOME all mm -hmm. the time, and I care a lot about that, and, and I have a lot of uh, friends in the GNOME community, and I want to build an operating system that is universal and that, that, that given that I mostly interface with the computer through the desktop, I care a lot about the desktop. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's what's uh, kind of surprising, actually, is, is, is if you think about it, desktop um, stuff is actually... If you if you look at the system management stuff, a ton more complicated <laughs> than server stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. This is something that people would never believe if they just if somebody tells it to them. But the reason for that is that that desktop stuff is something that is inherently dynamic. You can um, plug in any kind of hardware at any time, and you expect it to just work, right? Mm -hmm. um, servers are a lot more static. Like uh, um, they they sure there's iSCSI and there's USB nowadays on servers too. But it's but a clearly it's not, defined workload. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's much, much uh, stricter 
it's not supposed to be this general purpose thing that can does everything at any time right. and where the way it's executed changes with random network connectivity <laughs> yeah exactly it usually has very fixed uh, connectivity yeah. however um much of the stuff that's actually necessary in the desktop sooner or later always ends up on the server as well hmm. uh, which is which is like 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 i i'm UDEF, for example, UDEF was originally something um, that was supposed to make hot pluggy USB storage and these kind of things work. But nowadays, it's absolutely essential to boot up a server too. And servers have have hot pluggable storage nowadays um, since a long time too. For example, through iSCSI, um, but some servers you use USB and these kind of things. But um, like all the complex bits that that we have solved on the on the desktop side of things first ended up being incredibly useful on the on the, on the uh, server as well. Sure, and then. Uh, um, like there's lots of other areas where 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 things that system touches, um, where one area where Linux is used needs it, um, that, that this feature set is actually useful on a completely different area as well. Like my favorite example is always watchdog support. Um, like watchdog support. Like I'm not sure if you know the concept. It's basically about um, that if if uh, software doesn't ping a certain piece of hardware um, every uh, uh, five minutes or so, that the system automatically reboots. It's it's kind of a hang check, mm. right? Like if you, if the software stops um, uh, reporting to the hardware, the hardware will just reboot the entire thing. The software starts uh, fresh. Now we added uh, support for this kind of thing um, uh, to to systemd, especially for service management, so that if Apache hangs, it doesn't reply anymore, it doesn't ping the systemd anymore, that we can automatically detect that. Now um, this was a feature originally coming from the Amber people because if they if they build some kind of device that they want to put on the ground of the ocean or something like that they need to make sure that whatever happens even if the system fucks up completely um, that it comes back into a, a good state again um, fully automatically so they they were interested in this feature but then um, well interestingly all the desktop computers have this feature as well um, nowadays like they have the right. hardware the hard, watch their hardware so I could test it on my machine very very easily so I made sure it works and as it um, um, turned out the the high availability server people they love this feature too because they have the very same problem if they have a server where they need to guarantee that 99.999 percent of all time it's it's accessible mm -hmm. they need to have a scheme how it automatically can can react to to if the server is hanging so they love this thing so right. um while my personal, I, I personally interfa uh, uh, interface, of course, most of the time through a desktop with, with, with my computer, I personally care a lot about the desktop case. So do you um, think in five years, the, des the Linux desktop, from a developer that's creating software for Linux standpoint, is it doesn't matter if I'm on Arch or Fedora or maybe even Debian, from a developer standpoint in five years, is the desktop going to, going to look like a common platform for me to target? Is that kind of your hope? Well, it's certainly my hope. Like, um, it's this thing that I want to uh, make a reality is something like, um, like on the client side is, is something like Chrome books, basically sure. that are completely free and that just work with with generic distributions and and do the whole thing about it. Like that you can you can have them verified and and, and these kind of right. things automatically updated. All this wonderful stuff that Chrome OS delivers that we never managed to deliver. I want that on the Linux desktop, and I think it's absolutely reachable goal mm -hmm. um, in, in a relatively short um, amount of time. And then we can also do the app stuff, and then things will be better. But I certainly believe in the Linux desktop, and maybe it's not last year the the the, the desktop the year of the Linux desktop, and maybe it's yeah. not this year either. It's coming though. But, uh, it's, it, it is here for it's... some of us, right? It's for some of us already. And I think what you're working on is going to kind of bring it there for the rest of the industry. We need a really good accessible general technology platform. I, I, I want to make sure that, that that the Linux desktop is just a commodity that people can build their stuff on, on right. without thinking. Like if, if, if they want to build a new tablet that we actually have something to offer where they can just take it and right. and, and not have to, to, to write a lot of code of their own as they currently have to. Like, like for example, Android, which just takes a lot of free software and builds it in a completely right. different thing. And you thing. see a lot so, of manufacturers now just taking up Android where they could be using Linux. but they're, Exactly. Yeah. Very, I mean, of course, they will not initially, not very soon do that, but I really want to give them the option that they can do. And then bit by bit, we can win over um, all those manufacturers to actually ship yeah. open source by default. Um, and I mean, I, I believe that the reason that they're currently not doing that is simply because our offer is not convincing enough. And that's the thing that we need to to, to, to change. That's that's uh, that's going to be some interesting times. And, uh, Lennart, I'll follow your work. Good work on everything so far. Keep up the great work. And I hope to chat Very in much. the future as new developments come out. And uh, I'll also link to some of your talks in the show notes. Is there anything you want to point people to before we run? 
Um, well, I don't know if you have any questions about Systemd, um, uh, come by in the community. Like we, we have a very active IRC channel, send mails to the mailing list, and uh, we're always open to suggestions. I mean, there, there, there are some people in the community claim that we weren't, but actually we are. <laughs> and um, we, give, uh, uh, we, we try to make sure that everybody who sends us an email gets a reply. Um, sometimes it takes a bit longer. Like a couple, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know that one. <laughs> weeks because we have a lot of, 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 of mails to deal with. But uh, it is certainly my intention to reply to everybody who sends me an email. Very good. Well, good Lenart, thank you very much for coming on the Linux Action Show and keep up the good work. Thank you very much for having me. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Big show, big, big show. Uh, just maybe you'll just have to like sort of listen to this one th for like a while. It's probably going to end up being really long, so just stretch it out or put it on like fast play mode. Or there you go. Like that. Of course, if you're at this part, you're already in the home stretch. Good job. You've made it this far. Before we go, I want to give special mention to something that I think is great. We actually talked about it in the post show on Linux Unplugged, I think, but. Uh, QMU is doing the QMU emulator is doing a advent calendar. Oh, uh, my and God. every day it's a different virtual machine. Uh, so you can get the Julia Fractal right now, Fractal right now. But the one that really I thought was really awesome was you can get an Atari ST image, but that wasn't it. Modern DOS. It's a free DOS, Ooh. free DOS disk image contains the latest and greatest from the land of the disk operating system with a TCB IP stack that you didn't get to use before. It also includes uh, the freeware edition of Jetpack for crazy jetpack powered platform action. And then the other one they did, which I thought was super cool. Oh, man. <laughs> day one, because you can go back and get all of the days. Yeah. Day one was Slacker's Time Travel. Uh, the Slackware, the very first Slackware image they could find. Pre.10 version of Slackware, and it ships with Linux kernel 0 0.99. So it's really wow. a really neat thing they're doing. Uh, it's qmu-advent-calendar.org. We'll have a link in the show notes. That's hardcore. I like that. So a new image every day. Hey, we got to give a yeah. plug for Linux Unplugged. Man, this show has been rocking. So episode 69 came out last week where uh, we talked with Todd, who's working on the Librem a Purism 15 laptop, the laptop that we talked about before that's crowdfunded. And we talked to him about what it actually takes to custom build the perfect Linux mm. laptop. And, of course, 68, Charlie Reisinger and his class came on to talk about Linux in education. And on episode 70 this week, Matthew Miller from Fedora will be joining us again to talk about the release of 21, which will have been out for a couple of hours when he comes on the show Tuesday. Good stuff. Hey, Matt, yeah. if people want to read a little bit from your face, where would they go? I tried to go to datamation.com, scroll down to open source, or you can just click on the show notes and click on my name and all um, that good stuff. And there it is. Um, Articles happen. Right there. New one's coming up. Right there. I see it right there. Boomage. Hey, you know what else? I'll mention the subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Great place to leave us feedback, app mm -hmm. pick submissions, run Linux submissions, comment or vote. That just Damn. all helps make the show better, especially during the holiday season when the news cycle slows down. Okay. We could use your submissions. Also, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, choose Linux Action Show from the drop down. Boom. Boom! That's where the robots are to send your emails to us, and we'll read them on a future show. Yes! All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. You know what? I should have got a holiday sweater. I, I thought, uh, did you ever do that ugly sweater thing? I, I thought I about it. it. Yeah, yeah. You, I did it. I did it a long, a long time mm -hmm. ago. But uh, then I got like I literally no longer fit in all of my ugly sweaters. Oh yeah, no, I don't fit in most of my clothes now. <laughs> but yeah, I look back at the, just just the sweaters we used to wear in the '80s. I mean, they all qualify. Yeah. Um, especially the knit looking things. Yeah. Those things were yeah. horrible. God. Oh, Preppy great. years. Uh, you know, I think the horrible sweater uh, thing is a, is a good trend, but. Um, I'm skeptical of it for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. Are you? Do uh, you feel like it's great power and great responsibility? I'm a, like yeah, you can yeah, I'm a be little, abused. Yeah, I'm a little skeptical of mm -hmm. it. I'm a little skeptical of it. Okay. Uh, I don't know why, Matt. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, I don't feel like it's mobile that makes sense, to be honest with it's you, Matt. True. I, I don't feel like it makes sense. Well, if it's a sweater with a hole, you just put your finger in it. You know, I mean, there's always that. So. Whoa. Wow. Sweater holes. Whoa. Where did this go? Everybody has sweater holes. I'm sorry, if you have an armpit and a sweater, it's going to end up with yeah, holes. I know. It just, it's a thing. I it's know, like, it is. It is. And then true. you got to, like, I don't know, you, you end up messing with it, and then the hole gets bare, and it just becomes a problem. Now what are we talking about? Sweaters. Okay. <laughs> At least I was. <laughs> I'm not sure. I just wasn't sure. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I think, so you're saying you don't want to see it. I think I stepped into something with the whole Firefox challenge, because what yeah. I realized was is... What Firefox represents is the development of a browser based on ideals. Where yeah, a Chrome yeah, represents the true. development of a browser based on practicality, right? Practicalities, right? Because Firefox is 
the browser that just finally is getting open H.264 after fighting that. Firefox is the browser that completely missed the iOS platform because they couldn't use the Gecko engine. They would have to use WebKit. Whereas, mm. you know what? Uh, Chrome was like, hey, you know what? We'll release a browser for iOS and yeah. use the WebKit back end because it's close to what we already use and we'll can put a, we can put the Chrome around that that yeah. gives everybody the services they need built into the Chrome browser. So Chrome, so yeah. the Chrome browser, boom, becomes the number two browser on iOS, which is a huge platform. Uh, Chrome browser integrates Flash and, and offers a rather trouble-free, secure Flash environment based out right. of a sandbox, once again, out-featuring Firefox. Ooh. Chrome Im integrates different codecs yeah. much faster than Firefox does. Not always the free, open thing to do, but again, a practical compromise, mm -hmm. again, furthering Chrome's adoption. What I realized is, is there are people that look, that if Firefox is a loser, which it's not, but if, if people perceive it as a loser, sure. then perhaps what it's suggesting is designing software based on ideals is a losing concept when it's up against raw, cold commercial capitalism, which is the background of Chrome. And well, so I think yeah. maybe that's why some of the debate was so heated, because it's, it's not just uh, this browser versus that browser, but it fundamentally comes down to this development philosophy versus that development philosophy. Exactly. It's, it, well, it comes down to uh, Black Friday versus no Black Friday. I mean, it's literally the same mentality. You have the people who, such as, you know, that uh, are really in, uh, you know, really in against the idea of yeah. the whole concept. And that's great. I get that. Um, for me, I avoid it for practical reasons. I don't like being stepped on and I hate being around crowds of people. Right. So, you know, but uh, people will go there. You're saying, okay, don't get that, you know, $200 big screen TV because it's, you know, you're you're doing this, that, and everything. I think the same thing with browsers. It's when you have idealism versus something, that, instant gratification. But see, I think, you know, that's I think tough. showing the pros and cons of that. So the particular, yeah. like the challenge I did right. doesn't, doesn't play to the strengths of Firefox's development right, yeah, philosophy, where true. it did play to the strengths of the Chrome, because I wanted something that just worked, something that was easy to use on air, something that worked well with yeah. Flash, and well, those it, were all playing to Chrome true. strengths. And, pro and browser practicality, uh, it depends on the user's needs. I mean, like for Joe, I average, Firefox is fine, but when you have very specific intensive things for like a studio environment, it's not. This is why so. we're both switching to Opera. That's right, clearly, because Flash is such a dream there. <laughs>